Good morning. I hope you've had a good week. That was a lively tune to uh, begin our service today. Hopefully, uh, at some point here, we'll actually have our, our bells back in, in place. But I certainly appreciate their uh, conscientious work uh, down in the, uh, the lower portion of the building every Saturday, Sunday evening. And... Uh, I don't think I need to call to your attention anything about the service other than hopefully you have a copy of it as uh, uh, we continue our, our journey through the epiphany season. Uh, this will be the last time you're going to see the, the stars and the lights and the uh, tree um, as we move into uh, the latter part of, uh, of this season, looking forward to the uh, celebration of what we in the church know is the transfiguration that'll come in a, in a few more weeks. So may God bless you. It's great to, uh, to have you here as we uh, join in, in singing the, uh, the opening hymn, Hail, O Source of Every Blessing. And so we come together as God's people. In the name of the Father, in whom we live and breathe and have our being, and of the Son, whose blood was shed for our forgiveness, and of the Holy Spirit, who empowers us to live as God. Amen. 
since we are assembled here to hear God's word and to call upon him in prayer, let us think of our own unworthiness and confess before God that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and realize also that by our own strength we cannot free ourselves from our sinful nature. So I invite you to kneel if you wish as we are to remain standing as we consider those words and actions and thoughts that we're not particularly proud of but that uh, we can bring to our gracious God and Lord. Take a moment. Now remembering our failings and our failures, let us confess those sins to God our merciful Father. We have sinned against you, O God, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have passed by opportunities to share the gospel. We have been selfish with the gifts you have given us. We have not loved you or our neighbor as we ought. Forgive us our sins and renew us by the power of the Holy Spirit that we may live for your glory. Now upon this your confession, I have by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word and at the command of my Lord Jesus Christ announce his forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And so let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, governor of all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace in our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we hear the lessons appointed for this day. The Old Testament reading comes from 1 Samuel chapter 3, beginning at the first verse. The young man Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of, the, of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the young man. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. This is the word of the Lord. 
The epistle comes, from a, comes to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 through 20. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, in the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and it will also raise up his, us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. For you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. This is the word of the Lord. Be Please rise out of respect for our Lord and his words to us. As we find ourselves back in the first chapter of John's account of our Lord's life. And we pick things up then with the 43rd verse. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael. And he said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and he said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As you heard the gospel reading, you may have wondered, why does it start with the next day? What comes before? the particular day in which uh, Jesus encounters Philip. I'm glad you asked because I'm going to provide it for you. Uh, I actually want to use the calling of the first four of Jesus' disciples as the text for the day. And in order to do that, I've got to go back into the previous paragraph uh, where Jesus encounters Andrew. So I want to pick things up with, the, uh, uh, with that 38th verse of the first chapter of John. Where it says, Jesus turned and he saw them. We'll hear who the them are in just a minute. Following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and they saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day. For it was about the 10th hour. And one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. And he found Philip. And he said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Brothers and sisters, as we hear this account of these four men that will play prominent roles in the life of our Lord as his disciples, I suggest to you that there are some things that, that we as Jesus followers, as believers in this day and time, uh, can learn from what we see happening, specifically with Andrew and then the next day with Philip. But I want to begin by sharing with you a comment from Bill Bryson that I think speaks to what I suppose is part of the uh, issue across certainly America and the world today uh, as far as modern Christianity is concerned. And those that, uh, um, well, I'll let the quote speak for itself. People peek into the stable this time of year, but in a tragic sense, they never look beyond the plastic or porcelain baby lying in the manger. They may even visit the Lord's house on Christmas Eve, but they never enter into any kind of real relationship with him or invite him into their homes. End of quote. Okay, so what is Bryson talking about? Uh, Certainly this morning's text compels us to do more with Jesus than just sneak a peek or drop in for an occasional visit. And so let's see, as I at least attempt to take you quickly through the highlights of these verses that serve as our text. Keep in mind that John the Baptist 
Jesus' cousin, for the second time in two days, had pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God. And it is on that occasion then that at least two of his disciples begin to follow the master. But the interesting thing is, and I don't know whether you picked up on it, that Jesus did something so characteristic of his entire ministry. Not anything huge, but certainly something remarkable for a rabbi. He turned and he spoke to those who had been disciples and followers of John. That just didn't happen. Rabbis were aloof. They recognized their position and they all too often sort of... uh, uh, considered themselves above what uh, the Greeks called the hoi polloi, the commoners. But Jesus isn't that way. You know, maybe he knew that they were too shy to, to approach him directly, to, to ask something. So he made it easier, right? Isn't that how it is with us? If we break the ice, the other person may... Uh, more easily speak to us, kind of feel like they're not a stranger anymore. But this is certainly true of what uh, theologians call the divine initiative, you know, the fact that God always takes the first step. The Lord doesn't just leave a person in a situation of searching and searching and searching and searching. No, he goes out to meet that individual. You hear it in any number of settings uh, within the the context of the Gospels. As St. Augustine once said, we could not even begin to find God if he had not already found us. Isn't that what Jesus said? You didn't choose me, I chose you. Which was also most unusual for a rabbi to do it. Nobody else did. The common practice was that you kind of went and sought out the rabbi that you wanted to study under. And um, and, And then he kind of panned across the applicants and said, okay, that one and that one and that one. But anyway, the Greek here says that Jesus asked them uh, kind of a leading question, one might say, what are you looking for? That's literally what, what the Greek means. What are you looking for? And isn't that one of the most fundamental questions of life? What am I looking for? What's my aim and purpose in life? What am I really trying to be about as I live my life? You know, maybe it's a successful career with the accompanying perks of prominence and prestige and possessions and power. And then I see my hopes crushed when I'm passed up for that dream promotion. Or even worse, especially in these past months when I'm laid off through no fault of my own. Perhaps security is what I seek. And I think I found it in some person or something or some philosophy. Until one day, the bottom drops out of my life. And everything goes spinning out of control. Yes, what am I looking for? That question from Jesus. And the response that John's disciples gave was that they wanted to know where Jesus was staying. And you may have thought, what? 
Why do they want to know where he's staying? They're with him right there. They called him rabbi. This title of respect given by students and seekers after knowledge. Where are you staying? This was not the idle curiosity or nosy presumption of today's hangers-on, wild-eyed fans, adoring groupies. This is not inquiring minds want to know gawkers at supermarket tabloids. Not at all. This was a very characteristic Hebrew way of politely asking someone if they could do more than just have a chit chat with you. you know, these men wished to linger. They wished to continue on with Jesus. To talk about their, their problems and their troubles with him perhaps. To learn from him. To see what he was up to over the course of a period of time. And later, Philip's response to his friend, I don't know if you caught it, echoes the words of Jesus that you hear in the first part of this. Both of these accounts have that little phrase that's across the, the top of your bulletin. Come and see. Jesus says it to the first group. And Philip then reiterates it to his friend Nathaniel. Come and see. Except the interesting thing, if you look closely at it, and I realize you don't have the direct uh, quotation of Jesus, is that he says, come and you will see. And then that's echoed at the end of today's gospel lesson, right? Where he says to Nathaniel, you will see greater things than these. In the next sentence, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. It's as if he is ahead of them responding to what they haven't yet asked. Do you wish to know the solution to your problems? Would you like to discover the only lasting purpose in life? Are you ready to learn what your creator's priorities are? If so, then come and you will see. You will see. And John tells us that they did. Now the text doesn't provide us the uh, details of that day's visit or the intimacies of the ensuing conversation between Jesus and these four men. However, one thing is certain. One thing is absolutely true. Is that that contact of Jesus with Andrew and then Jesus with Philip built a fire under them. And I guess maybe more accurately, built a fire within them as the Holy Spirit led them to expand that little family of believers by sharing the great news of a savior. As Andrew, it says, first thing, that's the way it's phrased, found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. And then Philip, saying to his good friend, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, 
Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. That immediate response Andrew, with his brother, as he brings him to Jesus after rushing to find him, and then Philip. We don't know whether he has a brother, but we do know he has a good friend because he goes immediately to Nathaniel so that he too could become a part of this new family. And isn't that how it is still to be? To this very day. One brother or sister in the faith. Finding a relative or a friend or an acquaintance or a neighbor. And telling them about Jesus. In what you say and in how you live. Because that's an even stronger testimony. That's an, an even greater witness. It's all about Family. It's all about this family, the family of God. How can you and I who have become brothers and sisters through holy baptism bring others to know this one who is our Savior and our Lord? So the question I would pose to each of you today is, will you be an Andrew? Will you be a Philip in these coming days for Someone that you know who needs to know our Lord and Savior. And more specifically, who is your Simon Peter? Who is your Nathaniel? In a little while, as you stand or kneel before our Heavenly Father in prayer, I pray that he would Place before your eyes the face of that person that he wants you to tell this good news to. So that one day soon, as the Holy Spirit works through your words, uh, through your actions, through the life that, that gives testimony, remember what the Lord says, about being lights in our world. It's not just in what we say. More importantly, in what we do. That person who, that, who one day then can kneel with you here together as part of, of God's family. May we be like Andrew and Philip. Think about Andrew. You know, he's, he's not this, uh, this raving preacher like John the Baptist. Huh? You'd never think of him as a Billy Graham. Because if you pay attention in the gospel accounts... You see that Andrew's very quiet. He's very unassuming. But it's interesting. The people that he touches. In fact, I remember reading in a commentary, a commentary once that John's gospel portrays Andrew as the first home missionary and the first children's missionary and the first foreign missionary. When I read that, I thought, what? And then I did a little research. Okay. Who does he bring to the Lord? He brings his brother. From his own home. His own brother. And who's the next person that he brings to Jesus? Remember? A little boy with a sack lunch. That leads to the feeding of 5,000 people. That's Andrew. And then a group of Greeks that he talks to. And he encourages and brings to meet his Lord and his Savior. Philip too. Then 
that impactful touch and word that these two disciples bring into their personal life. How about you and me? There are a lot of people out there in the houses of Chattanooga, Hickson, and East Ridge, and Ringgold, Sidey Daisy. Houses that can become a home for Jesus if their inhabitants learn this one who is our Lord and Savior. So once again, I would, I would leave you with this question. Would you be an Andrew or a Philip to that person that needs to know the love of a Savior and the sacrifice of one who offered his own life? Yeah, we're thinking about Jesus now in these early days during this epiphany season. But will you know where that story goes? To a cross and an open tomb and an invitation. Which Jesus himself reminds us, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. You and I have found the Messiah. What will we do with that incredible discovery in the days ahead? Amen. Now may the The peace and the knowledge of a Savior keep our hearts and minds in our Lord and Savior. In the Saturday service, the, um, the song that was scheduled in our bulletin was after the creed, except I through the phrase band a curve by introducing the, the song and then using it to reflect on our statement of faith. The song that was sung was Amazing Grace. And we tend to think of that song speaking about Jesus, right? You ever paid real close attention to the words? It doesn't mention Jesus. John Newton talks about grace, that undeserved love. He hints at Jesus, but it also speaks to a father who sent his son and a Holy Spirit who has brought us into God's family. And so even though we're not going to be singing, <laughs> I see Judy up there going, oh no, <laughs> pastor didn't tell me. Uh, even though we're not going to be singing Amazing Grace, I want you as we speak these words of the Apostles' Creed to think about the grace of God as that's reflected in what God our Father has done, in what our Lord and Savior Jesus, and what the Holy Spirit has accomplished uh, in and through us. So would you join me as we, as we turn to the words of this confession of faith. Please rise. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. And the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we prepare for a time of prayer, as we uh, join as, as the church to lift up individuals and concerns, there are a number of individuals whose friends and families are grieving at this time. You see the note about uh, Mildred uh, Brewster, that's Scott's uh, mom, one of our elders. A little further down in the uh, the listing that's uh, there in your bulletin is Carmen Gonzalez, uh, this right-hand man of my father for decades down in South Texas as the Lord called him home yesterday. A little further down, Ellen Phillips, friend of Joni Renhacks, very ill. With COVID, the Lord called her home on Friday. And then just before the service last night, uh, Jamie Mofsky called out a, a high school friend of hers, uh, Chris Ra Ramsey, as uh, he passed from this life into the one to come. And so we remember those that, uh, that mourn at this time. See also those that are in need of the Lord's healing and his, his strength. Myra Jo Fraley, that's uh, uh, Steve Hastings' uh, mother, as she is uh, continuing to uh, deal with the uh, impact of COVID. Uh, Kathy Brackenhoff, uh, who has, uh, Byron told me this morning, uh, they have uh, done the surgery yesterday and... Um, removed the mass that was there. Um, his brother, Bernie, uh, out west, he is back home but having lots and lots of, of back pain. See also uh, Ron Siffering, that's uh, Lori Lynn's dad. He was hoping to be home, that's what the note says, but the doctors have decided to keep him there for five more days. Um, and then an 18-year-old, um, Summer Viles, this uh, granddaughter of a lady that's down at the uh, gas station, a good friend of Julia's and mine over these past uh, years as uh, she's dealing with uh, ulcerative colitis. Uh, Dr. Jim Hall, he, is, uh, he has gotten worse and is now hospitalized and uh, Julie Williams from our church, his caregiver, has tested positive. Um, Alta Hook. 
as uh, some of the complications with her uh, need of, uh, of God's touch. You see others that are there that we have lifted up to the Lord over these past weeks. Terry Alsba and Bill Erickson and Brigitte Goltzer. Uh, Tom told me that uh, she has had that uh, surgery as of a couple of days ago. And so they are um, hoping that that will solve this problem. Uh, Pastor Joe Jacks, Brad and Laura Oshoni, Tim Spencer, Helen Feldman, Ethan Weiss. And certainly as far as, and we give thanks that uh, Bill Porter is, uh, is home and continuing his rehab. I was there taking them communion and, and they're, uh, uh, they're very, very grateful for all of your prayers. Um, Lori Lynn's brother, Gary uh, McDaniel. Uh, I didn't know until she told me that practically the whole family who were together here at Christmas time, uh, all the way down to two-year-olds, uh, have tested positive for COVID. So um, this is obviously, as you know, serious stuff. Um, and as far as our country is concerned, just that that uh, peace and harmony would prevail as we uh, as we move forward uh, through this week of uh, a very uh, uh, important event uh, happening in in D.C. Certainly, we pray that uh, uh, that those that are on the front lines, so to speak, whether that's police or EMTs or medical folks who are who are dealing with you know. Uh, different kinds of issues, uh, our military, uh, that the Lord would bring all of them safely uh, back home to their families and would, uh, would watch over them, send his angels. And I know that you have folks that you would uh, wish to bring before uh, our gracious and, and loving God. You'll have that opportunity in the course of uh, this time of prayer. So... I would invite you to uh, to kneel or to stand as we uh, pray the prayer of the church. We praise you, O oh God, for having called us to faith by the power of your Holy Spirit. Your grace and mercy is new to us every day. May the people praise you, O God. May all the people praise you. We pray for your church. May the gospel of salvation be preached in its truth and purity. Bless all who teach in Sunday schools, and Bible classes, and classrooms, and in our colleges and seminaries. Open the hearts and minds of hearers that your word may flourish. Lord, in your mercy. And bless the nations, O Lord. May peace and justice flourish. And may all leaders govern with wisdom and justice and mercy. We thank you for the privilege of living in a country where we can worship you in freedom. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. Give us grace, we pray, to live as your children. Give us opportunities to invite those who do not know you to come and see that Jesus Christ is Lord. Give us boldness to take advantage of those opportunities and use us as your instruments to bring the gospel of salvation to those around us. Lord, in your mercy. And we thank you for having provided for our daily needs. Now give us a spirit of compassion for those who are hungry and homeless. Move us to generously share the gifts you have given to us with those in need, that your love may be known through us. May the people praise you, O God. May all the people praise you. And we pray for the sick, the mourning, the lonely, and the troubled. Especially we pray for these that we've mentioned, but also these that we bring to you now in our hearts to your throne of grace.
accept our praises and intercessions and petitions as we say, Lord, in your mercy, may the people praise you, O God. May all the people praise you. Amen. We pray our family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be and remain with you each and all. Amen. May be seated. Normally I have a very quick comment or two, but there's a little bit more this time just to remind you that there is an upcoming um, special voters meeting will be happening on the last Sunday of this month, the 31st at 5 o'clock. It has to do with a request that has come from our national church body from the synod because of COVID. This is uh, a preparatory year for next year's synodical convention, but not all of our districts are going to be able to meet because an awful lot of them meet in January and February and March um, and April. And none of those are, are going to be meeting because of COVID. So uh, this hasn't happened since 1944. <laughs> okay. Figure that, you know, end of World War II, where we, by a vote in our 6,000 plus congregations, um, basically pushed the Synodical Convention from next year to 2023, so that all of the districts can, can meet prior to it. So anyway, uh, an important vote. Uh, for us to be a very, very short uh, Zoom meeting, I would assume probably no more than 20 minutes uh, at the most. But uh, it, it 
needs to be done. So just there'll be some more uh, details in next week's bulletin and probably for the 31st also. Uh, beyond that, here's a daily reading guide that uh, comes to us from uh, Lutheran Bible translators. So uh, there are copies of that in the back that you can take with you. Um, what else? What else? Um, if you're interested in getting the, uh, uh, the Lutheran Witness at home, uh, you know, just uh, call the office and that can be set up. We do need to turn in those subscriptions by uh, the 25th of January. And you heard me mention about the, uh, uh, the decorations that are here and in our windows and other places around the church. Uh, if you have some free time Tuesday at, uh, what is it, 6 o'clock that Lori put down? Yes. Um, we'll, uh, we'll take things down and uh, put them away for, for another year. I think that's everything. Let's see any other hands. All right. May, may God go with you. I look forward to uh, looking at the first two readings for today, um, the one out of 1 Samuel and the other out of uh, 1 Corinthians. Um, so Bible class will, will start in about, um, uh, about 10 or 12 minutes. May God go with you and as you uh, have the opportunity, serve as a blessing in the lives of those around you.